Welcome to the second part of our mini-series examining the women as background decoration trope in video games. I need to stress that this video comes with a content warning and is not recommended for children. The game footage I'll be showcasing will be particularly graphic and include scenes of extreme violence against women. I define the women as background decoration trope as the subset of largely insignificant, non-playable female characters whose sexuality or victimhood is exploited as a way to infuse edgy, gritty, or racy flavoring into game worlds. These sexually objectified female bodies are designed to function as environmental texture while titillating presumed straight male players. In our last video, we discussed the concept of sexual objectification and looked at a specific subset of non-essential female characters, which I classify as non-playable sex objects. In this episode, we will expand our discussion of the women as background decoration trope to examine how sexualized female bodies often occupy a dual role as both sexual playthings and the perpetual victims of male violence. Are you here for the whore? Are you dirty, me? I have your money. Let her go! No! Take it up with Cesare! <laughs> the use of sexual or domestic violence as a form of scaffolding to prop up dark and edgy environments has become a pervasive pattern in modern gaming. Let's start by what happened or didn't happen last week at Utah State. Explain the threats and what you were going to Utah State for. Sure. Um, so the school received um, some threats against my life and of the students on Monday night. Uh, the threats were, as you had described, um, very much reminiscent of these copycat killers of um, these, you know, big. Uh, misogynist school massacres. I didn't actually find out about the threats until I landed at Salt Lake City uh, Airport on Tuesday afternoon, and I found out with everyone else um, through Twitter and through the media. So when I spoke to the, organi the organizers of the event and the police, I wanted to know what security precautions they were taking. Um, it wasn't the first time I was threatened at an event, but this one was—the language was very— um, it was much more intense in terms of that sort of misogynist, anti-feminist attack. So, um, you know, the school said that they were going to take uh, not allow backpacks in and have extra security. And when I asked about Utah's concealed gun laws, um, they said that they couldn't screen for firearms. Uh, I asked them if they could have uh, metal detectors or pat downs, and they said no. Um, and that was just too big of a risk for me to take in terms of my life and that of the students when the threat was specifically about firearms. Now, the person signed their email threat, Mark Lapine. I wanted yeah. to go back to a Canadian news report about what became known as the Montreal Massacre. Um, this is an excerpt from the TV show 100 Huntley Street. December 6, 1989 started off like any other day, but ended in horror, forever being labeled in Canadian history as the Montreal Massacre. A young man identified later as Marc Lapine entered Le Col Polytechnique in Montreal, opening fire, killing 14 female engineering students before turning the 22 caliber gun on himself. This was the first school shooting of its kind in Canada. That report from 100 Huntley Street, Magdalene John, in Canada. So, Anita Sarkeesian, for those who didn't know what that name meant um, in the email uh, that was sent to the Utah, Utah state officials, if you could take it from there. Uh, yeah, it, it was very much, um, you know, specifically referencing Mark Lapine as his hero, um, using his name, referencing this Montreal massacre about this mass shooting that was very specifically anti-feminist. He was he was he was going to kill and actually did kill these women because he considered them feminists and that you know feminists ruined their life his life apparently. Um, the the threat that we received at the school uh, last week was was exactly the same as that. 
Um, there was another threat that came in that mentioned Elliot Roger, which was um, a young man who uh, committed another school shooting at UC Santa Barbara earlier this year. And his manifesto was very much the same language of um, anti-women, anti-feminist, very deeply misogynist. This is a video game developer, Brianna Wu, speaking to CNN over the weekend about so-called gamer gators threatening her. I posted a meme making fun of one of um, one of my fans sent uh, me a meme, and it made very gentle fun of gamer gators. And I posted it, and you know, as a response to that, game pro gamer gator people and the the site Achan ended up um, making thousands of memes targeting me, and it escalated to death threats. That was uh, video game developer Brianna Wu. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian is with us today, media critic and executive director of Feminist Frequency, a video web series that explores representations of women in pop culture, who withdrew from her speaking engagement at Utah State after the school got an email threatening to commit the worst massacre in American history. Anita, can you talk about what uh, Brianna said and uh, talk about these uh, video games that you are overall criticizing? Sure. Um, so one of the, the things that she's referencing is, um, you know, we have this larger culture in gaming um, where a subset of mo mostly male gamers have been viciously going after women and attacking them. Um, it's mostly women who speak up, <clears throat> excuse me, who speak up against, um, you know, actually speak up for the inclusivity of games, right? Speak up in terms of creating more diversity in games. Um, and there, right now, this reference of Gamergate is sort of this big culmination of these, these toxic harassment, this toxic harassment campaign that's been happening to me for years and to many other women. Um, and so they're, they're sort of lashing out and, and going after women in these horrible, vicious ways, um, sort of as, as um, trying to preserve gaming as, as you know, a male-dominated space, as the status quo. Um, but they're doing it under the guise of uh, journalist, journalism ethics. Um, but really, what's happening is they are attacking women. Explain what happened to Zoe Quinn. Sure. Um, and who Zoe she is. is an independent game developer, and um, an ex of hers wrote a big diatribe um, saying awful things about her, um, which were not true. Um, and you know, he claimed that she had slept with a journalist to get coverage for her game, which was also not true. Um, and she, I mean, her game is a free game. There's no need for her to try to get any press for it. But it was, it was, an, it was another example of going after women and trying to discredit us and silence us, um, and, and in some very personal ways. And why did that become so extreme, and that became what is known as Gamergate? Um, I think it became. I think it culminated in at this time because they sort of latched onto this idea of journalism ethics, and that became something that sounded good. Um, but it was a way for them to mask their sexist temper tantrum, um, where they've been going after women for years. Uh, and so I think because of the intensity and um, how many people they're going after and just the sheer toxicity of, uh, of their behavior, a lot of people in the games industry um, and in the community and in the industry have started to really take note of the fact that we have a problem. Um, we have a problem with sexism and misogyny, and we need to do something about it. I want to play two short clips from a video game you've critiqued, Dragon Age Origins. Let go of me! Stop, please! It's a party, isn't it? Grab a whore and have a good time. <laughs> Savor the hunt, boys. Well, that's one less elf breeder in the world. A shame, though. Nice body on that one. She's still warm. How picky are you, anyway? That's from Dragon Age Origins. Uh, can you respond to this, Anita Sarkeesian? Sure. So one of the big, um, one of the most important pieces of what I do is talking about how we can love a piece of media and also critique it at the same time. So a series like Dragon Age is a highly beloved series that has a lot of great things about it. Um, but there are some examples of, of, you know, violence against women and sort of exploiting um, women's bodies uh, or exploiting their vulnerability um, in these really awful ways. And so that's just one of many examples of games that do that, uh, that, that that sort of take advantage of this vulnerability to try to make players feel 
uh, more intense, right, to make these worlds more gritty. You know, gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry that is um, bigger than Hollywood at this point uh, in terms of revenue. So it has a huge cultural impact on our society. Um, the last statistic that I saw, I believe, is about um, 27 percent of developers are women. So we still have a huge problem with, um, with gender equity within the development community. Um, but about 40 to 46 percent of gamers are actually women. Um, so this, this idea that gamers are all men are, is actually not true, that we, we are almost, women are almost half of the gaming uh, players. I wanted to ask you about the comments that, come on, this is just online stuff. It's pretty harmless. Why you take it so seriously, Anita? Online harassment, especially gendered online harassment, is an epidemic. Um, women are being driven out. Um, they're being driven offline. This isn't just in gaming. This is happening across the board online, especially with women who participate in or work in male-dominated industries. So the harassment actually has a very real effect on us as a society um, in, in terms of making this space you know, unwelcoming for women. But it also has a chilling effect. So women who are watching this happen, who are watching me get terrorized for two years, are going to question whether they actually want to be involved, whether they want to speak up and whether they want to participate.